century, the Human Genome Project managed to sequence the first human genome. After $3 billion and the work of numerous academic institutions and governmental organizations. But since then, there hasn't been a lot of what we can make out of the genome. As biologist Eric Lander says, genome, bought the book, hard to read. And what he really means by this is that the genome is incredibly hard to interpret. And there's so many processes and functions behind it that we know very little about. Only 2% of the genome is actually mapped out, and out of that very there's many mutations that we haven't mapped out yet. So how can we essentially convert the genome into actionable information? But let's take a step back and review some basic biology. Every gene consists of a promoter, an intron, and promoters, introns, and exons. The promoter is essentially the part of the gene that initiates transcription, which is the process of transcribing DNA to RNA. The next part is introns. Introns are nearly 10,000 nucleotides long in every single gene. And they are basically like the logic if you were to compare them to a computer program. So they basically are like the brains behind the gene and they control binding and a lot of that and basically are the logic behind how binding works. Whereas exons are only 100 nucleotides long and are kind of like the print statements on a simplified level that kind of print the logic from the introns. And essentially how it works is DNA is transcribed into RNA, and RNA is translated to make proteins. And proteins are really essential for a lot of our life's functions. But right now, we know very little about it. It's not just a three-step process. DNA can also interact with proteins, not just RNA. And, R and proteins can interact with RNA. So it's a lot more complex than it really seems makes out to be. And there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of different functions that biologists haven't fully understood. So a good way to summarize this is basically to say that our ability to measure biology and our ability to alter biology through gene editing tools is really good, but our ability to interpret and understand biology is far limited when we compare it to the other two. So over the past two months, I've been really interested in trying to use machine learning to try to solve this problem of understanding how our genome works and the project I've been working on is essentially trying to use a convolutional neural network to predict protein binding, um, protein binding interactions in our genome. So essentially, I've been trying to implement DeepBind, which is a CNN created by researchers at the University of Toronto. And what it does is it takes in experimental data and puts it through a model, and it outputs something called binding affinity. And binding affinity is how likely um, it is that the certain, um, a certain protein will bind to the sequence. And essentially how this works on a more technical level is it takes in the sequential data and it goes through a convolution stage. And what it does is it essentially scans the data using a set of motif detectors, which are essentially a matrix of four by M, where M is basically the number of parameters. And then once it does this, it generates a set of motif scans and goes to the rectification stage, where it essentially applies an activation function. I use ReLU to basically clamp all the negative values to zero and isolate certain patterns or motifs in the, in the sequential data. After this, it goes to the pooling layer. And what the pooling layer does is it uses two different methods, max pooling and average pooling. And what average pooling does is essentially allows us to understand uh, the cumulative effects of shorter motifs. And motifs are just generally different patterns that we recognize in our genome. Whereas Max pooling allows us to understand the effects of longer motifs, so basically sequences or patterns which have a longer strand of nucleotides. After this, we feed it into a new, uh, we get feature maps, and these feature maps are essentially fed into a nonlinear neural network. And the purpose of the neural network is essentially to output a binding score. So what the binding score is is essentially it takes in a vector z, right? And z is essentially a one by d vector where d is the number of uh, motif detector is used, and then it applies um, it applies a weight, which is W, to each um, to each, each value in the vector, and then applies an additive bias to get a binding score. And the binding score is essentially how confident the how confident the neural network is in that whether the protein is is gonna bind to the sequence or not. And essentially, what it does is it basically takes in a loss function by comparing this to the target value and uses Bragg propagation and stochastic gradient descent to update different parameters such as the learning rate. And then based off this, 
Based off the training, based off uh, training, you evaluate random calibrations of hyperparameters. So hyperparameters are things such as the dropout probability and the learning rate, and basically we randomize the values for these hyperparameters and then figure out what um, model configuration gets us the highest accuracy. And based off this higher accuracy, we basically um, train it on further um, on data and to try to get the highest accuracy possible. And based off this model configuration that works the best, we test it on new data that hasn't been seen before. But why is this? So basically how this is done is essentially, um, this is kind of the code for essentially saving a lot of the hyperparameters. So it basically checks if the accuracy is essentially better than the previously um, uh, the previous highest accuracy. And based off that, it saves all the hyperparameters and um, into a separate file so that it can be read and then used in further training. And why this is so important is what we can do is we can basically in silico, we have computer simulations, basically change the nucleotides at certain binding sites and determine whether that's, that has a positive or negative interaction on basically DNA protein binding. So for example, if you take a look at mutations in the cholesterol gene, if we, for example, take the ones with a higher height, the sequence, the nucleotides, have a strong interaction. And basically, um, where, it, where it shows purple colors means that basically changing the, nucle the mutation at that point essentially creates a higher binding affinity, whereas if it's a negative mutation, it has a lower binding affinity. And sometimes the reason why this is so important is our abi the ability for mutations to essentially um, disrupt binding sites can either have a negative or positive impact. It can even disrupt basically the process of transcription, which can eventually lead to disease. So this is a super important problem, and by using a model like this, we can essentially understand how mutations work and the effects of these mutations, and on top of that, understand where they're binding, and specifically design genetic med medications to try to counteract the, result, the, the problems relating to negative mutations. So, Let's try to make our ability to measure and alter biology equal to our ability to interpret biology. Thank you.